This Marina Life with MDL Marinas. I think the biggest challenge for us is going to be getting to the start line theoretically. It's, it's going to be amazing to you know, have three years of dreams into reality. We're looking at autonomous floating robots that roam around arenas picking up garbage. We want to help our customers to recycle more and ultimately to produce less. That's got to be the long-term target. I think the easiest one for us is just to try and reduce our usage of things which only have a single life. So certainly single-use plastics, making sure that we reuse as much as possible. Hello and welcome to This Marina Life with MDL Marinas and me, Kerry Herford-Jones. This show is all about the central role MDL are playing in helping to reduce plastic and waste in their marinas and therefore helping to reduce the amount of plastics going into our oceans. A serious subject with some serious guests, but I can promise you some very entertaining and interesting discussions. And you can follow more about the stories that you hear about today on hashtag Green Marinas or search MDL Marinas. In this episode, you'll hear from the twins who've climbed mountains, attempted to cross ice caps and are now on a series of global expeditions to reach the world's poles of inaccessibility, all part of the MDL-supported Blue Pole Project. We'll also meet up with Joe Walton, who, as MDL's Head of Health, Safety and Environment, has a critical role to play in reducing plastic and waste in the many marinas the company run. We'll also hear from Dr. Adam Reed, fascinating chap and the director of external affairs at a company called Suez UK. These guys are pioneering sustainable solution people who are at the heart of innovative technologies for the UK's circular economy. And finally, we'll meet our old friend Holly Manville, the founder of Clean Sailors, who's brought together a group that is raising awareness of ocean conservation opportunities within the sailing fraternity. Great to hear from her and I think you'll really enjoy hearing from all four of our guests today. First up, let's hear from the Turner Twins about how the Blue Pole project actually came about. We decided about five years ago that we wanted to reach all these poles of inaccessibility and our strategy for it was start off with the cheapest ones and obviously then build from there so that it became easier and easier and you built up trust with brands so you could ask more and more money. Yeah. And then COVID came along and obviously everything stopped. And we reassessed our travel plans and we thought, right, we, we can't do anything land-based for at least the next year, probably two years because of all the lockdowns. So what else can we do? And we thought, well, you're still allowed to sail. And so we thought, right, let's see if we can raise some money for this boat and do the Atlantic Pole of Inaccessibility two or three years earlier than planned. But because of COVID, you know, we were kind of forced to. And very fortunately, we got a couple of major sponsors on board for the project. And I say the rest is history. And this is all about a, a project that can benefit a lot of people. But you're actually taking it on tour as well. There's a 13 uh, city tour involved here. Yes, so the whole project is revolving around sustainability and championing brands that are changing towards a more sustainable future, whether that's a product or a service. We're putting an electric motor on the boat, we're using some new anti-fouls and we're doing obviously the research. So there's, it's very much focused on understanding the issues facing our oceans and then we're going to take that concept and go around the UK in August, September, into October where we'll have a pop-up cinema, a bar for those that are thirsty and we'll be giving talks about ocean plastics in partnership with our partners. It's all being documented and filmed for, for Red Bull and Apple TV as well as Water Bear. So yeah, it's a great chance for us to you know tour the UK, meet the local communities that are living by the coast and uh, have some fun while we're doing it. Let's talk a bit more about the preparation for that boat that you've got there. Talk us about what sort of boat it is and how much adaptation you've had to do. Well, it's an interesting story how we got it. It's a class 40 <laughs> and she's number 37 hull. So quite early on in the evolution of building class 40 yachts and we're trying to find one obviously it's a very busy market out there as soon as a new one comes onto the market or a second hand one they're totally gone very quickly so we really struggled for about 
six months to find one. So I went on to Instagram to see if I could find out where the lower numbers were. <laughs> and I found this guy um, at the front of number 37 and I messaged him. He was on the east coast of the US and I just said, look, who's the owner? Is it for sale? And he said, not sure, here's the owner. So I phoned the owner up and said, is it for sale? He said, no, but make me an offer. So <laughs> ma ma made him an offer and it's now over here. There's been quite a bit of adaptation to be done. Uh, we've ripped the diesel engine out, the fuel tanks, obviously everything that um, belongs to a diesel engine has been taken out. And now we've just got a very small sail drive with an electric motor on top. And beside that are two four and a half or five and a half kilowatt batteries and that's about it really talk us through one or two of those small things you just referenced there well like we say we, we have got a sail drive a yanmar sail drive 25 which i'm sure lots of listeners are familiar with but the flange or the base which that sits on is too high for to give clear enough clearance for the propeller needed underneath the hull now obviously we need a bigger propeller because the rpm that the electric engine delivers is a lot less than what a diesel engine is so we've had to change the pitch and the size of the prop but obviously with an even shorter new sail drive and a bigger propeller we've had to drop the base of that a lot further than we needed to otherwise it would have been quite a simple uh, simple fix. The keel was angle grinded out, so we've got some glass work to be done underneath. I think it's That's also quite annoying. It's also the simple things of now there's a where the exhaust for the diesel engine went out the back of the boat. That's now got to be filled up because obviously water's just going to now just pour in. So it's just all the little things that just add that little complication. And because we're not um, glass fibre experts and we certainly haven't played with it at home, um, we've just got to get somebody in, and obviously that takes time and and money i mean su supply chains people are busy it's such a busy time down here even at saxon wharf you've got the guys here on the cranes lifting in boats lifting out boats all day long it's all go 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 yeah and let's face it the marine sector is something still relatively new to you both it is to a certain extent yes i mean obviously we rode across the atlantic back in 2011 we grew up on the south coast of Dartmoor, so near the, near the coast, and we sailed a lot. But as far as getting hands-on with your own boat, yeah, this is a complete jump into the unknown, really. Well, that's what adventure is all about, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think when we get to the start line, we'll be like, right, we're done. We're absolutely when, done. <laughs> when, when, you, when you start getting that funny feeling in your tummy going, oh, what have we done? I think that's, you know, that's your boundary. And as long as you can keep pushing that a little bit, I think it... It's a nice thing. Mm. Let's just look at the aspirations, the goals, the measures of success, because as seasoned adventurers that you are, it, there's no point in setting off unless you've got an end goal in sight. And it's not just going to a spot in the, on the map uh, or on a chart, but it's actually what you're going to do when you get there and how you're going to measure that success. Talk me through some of the strategies around that, please. So what this project is aiming to do is to support a plastic research that Plymouth University's International Marine Litter Research Unit um, will be conducting. They've got uh, a PhD student who is essentially calibrating the Sentinel-2 satellite from the European Space Agency. There's about six Sentinel satellites, I think, that have all public uh, data. All that data is accessible and what the camera is doing on the Sentinel-2 satellite is, is taking images of the North Atlantic. So the PhD student is using us to get some ground truth on what that plastic is. So every time we sail past some plastic, we're going to be taking some photos, we're going to be taking some samples, and we're going to be logging where that position is. Now, he's obviously then going to look at the data for all the images from the sentinel 2 satellite and he's going to be able to work out or understand much better um, about what exactly the sentinel satellite is taking an image of and ultimately that's going to create a much clearer picture on how much plastic or what type of plastic is in the north atlantic gyra because that that is all modelled, so what we're doing is trying to get some actual ground truth and further understand what what plastic is actually in the Atlantic. The reality which we spoke to Richard Thompson, who's head of the department down there at Plymouth University, he said like the chance of seeing no plastic is fairly high because I think what a lot of people don't realise is that plastic sinks after a while. So y yeah. yes, arguably the surface is clearing up because it's sinking. We've got a load of stats 
about ocean plastic and how much plastic is on the ocean floor and it's really really disturbing like you you know the the figures where you read trillions you're like nah that's just made up that's a load of rubbish and but that's the reality of what's going on just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there and measure of success then clearly all this data is going to be pulled together there's going to be years worth of research coming off the back of it what about for you guys what are you going to feel at the end of this project relief i think i think <laughs> apart from relief i think it's it's massively ambitious but it's very achievable i think the most important thing for us is on the uk tour is to influence one two three four people plus whatever it is to go look we want to normalize hydrogen so when we're going around the uk tour rather than having a hydrogen engine which is massively expensive on a yacht we're bringing the hydrogen generator to the dock site so it's just like any other normal generator you can pick up with your hands put it in the back of your car and we're going to charge the electric engine with that so just to give you context a honda little generator that you can get the smart looking ones do about four liters an hour if you're plugged in this generator or the tcp group who are providing it 426 grams of hydrogen is going to give us 30 hours of charge. Now you can start doing the maths of how much fuel you'd need, the cost of that, I think something like 50 litres for the day, compared to just over 400 grams. Goodness. It's a life changer. It, it really is. I think people forget how dense in energy hydrogen is, and it fits into everyday society. You know, there's the guy who we're working with does thousands of units a month. It's proving the model, isn't it? It's bringing it into the mainstream, into the consciousness of people, that actually there are viable alternatives to fossil fuels. Absolutely, absolutely. And he, he was also saying, because of diesel prices going up so much, it's now in some places cheaper to run hydrogen than it is diesel. So look, uh, MDL, good partners and obviously ones that you wanted to associate with. Talk to me a little bit about how the MDL partnership came about. Well, we were trying to work out where the boat would arrive from the US, where it would arrive into the UK, and also, therefore, where was the best location, what marinas were around Southampton once we found out that it was going to be arriving in Southampton. And obviously QAB we're, we're familiar with, which is down in Plymouth, and we've been in there a few times. And they were the immediate marinas we thought we, we would go to because they've got this greener marina campaign, very focused on sustainability. So that aligned perfectly with the overall uh, values of the project. And obviously they've got Saxon Wharf and Shamrock, and they've got various... A number of marinas um, based in in the Solent and the Southampton area. So that was ultimately the easiest decision we've ever made. Now the hardest one was trying to get in touch with them and trying to ask if a couple of lads with limited sailing experience could come and put a boat in the yard and and work on it for a while. <laughs> and of course they said yes eventually. Eventually they did. No, they, um, you know, MDL have been absolutely brilliant. The team here, led by David, have been absolutely superb in, in accommodating everything that we need. Moving the boat around, moving the keel. And actually, Saxon Wharf here has been brilliant just because everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's working on their boats and everybody's sharing their ideas sharing their stories what do you do here what do you do there have you got somebody you could recommend there so it's an absolute perfect location to just absorb and sponge off knowledge from everybody else in the yard that are doing things whether it's a small sailing boat or a massive hundred foot yacht for both of you just give me a quick 30 second summation of your own personal connection to this in terms of how you're going to feel during process at the end, all the rest of it, just from a personal point of view. I think it's going to be incredibly, I say emotional. I mean, everyone knows whether you're renovating a house, a car, in our case, a boat, you put a huge amount of hours and time into it and you, you only ever see the finished product and not the actual work that goes into it. We're pulling at least 16 hours a day on messing around with it, if not more just to get her ready on the water. So I think at the end of this, I'm going to be incredibly proud probably of 
just getting her onto the water in such a short amount of time. The amount of people that are involved in the project from MDL, the boatyard, the boat builders, the electricians, bringing all of that together and learning it on the way, for me, I think the biggest challenge for us is going to be getting to the start line theoretically. But yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing to you know, have three years of dreams into reality. My next guest is Joe Walton, the head of health and safety and environment from MDL. I asked him to tell us more about how they're actually helping to reduce plastic and waste in their marinas. We always look at, at ways of reducing our impact on the environment. So whether that be general and recycling waste contracts when they're due for renewal, hazardous waste contracts, or whether that be items of plant and looking at options for uh, more environmentally friendly items. Because this isn't a passing fad, this is now at the heart of many, many businesses and MDL is no different to that, is it? No, absolutely not. It's high on our priorities. I think probably the marine industry is a little bit behind other industries, but we're certainly ploughing on and it's certainly heading in the right direction. There's something upon all of us to grab this now and you're providing a service for birth holders, but there's a place actually there for birth holders to play their part as well, isn't there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Gen- general waste, for example, one one of our biggest asks of the birth holders is for effective segregation of their waste streams, which makes it far easier to s- source and get to the right uh, disposal routes. So, yeah, there, there's lots of ways that birth holders can help, but uh, there are some key areas that would be, be beneficial to all. And how and where do you, MDL, actually provide secure waste and recycling? And what types of recycling can you now offer for people? So all of our sites offer some form of waste disposal area. Now, depending on the, the complexity of it, complexities of the site, that can range from general waste, a dry mixed re- recycling, which is paper, plastic bottles, etc., right the way through to diesel, waste oil, antifreeze, antifoul paint tins, and then everything in between, really. When it comes to boats, there is quite a lot of chemical usage and all sorts of things going on around. But you're seeing the manufacturers now also starting to take responsibility, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly in the marine industry, I have a reasonable amount of involvement in our plant projects. So when we're purchasing new items of plant, obviously we're running at the moment with low emission engines anyway, as they have to be provided into the UK. But a lot of our manufacturers are now looking at electric options for boat dry stack forklifts etc so yeah it's very much developing and you've got all these options there for birth holders to be able to take advantage of the recycling opportunities you mentioned their oil just just one of them i've seen a, a few sites now offering recycling for anodes as well yeah, anno battery, battery recycling. I'm talking to some of our suppliers at the moment that they're not in place yet, but we'll be looking at other projects going forward, which will include hopefully things like reverse vendor machines for plastic bottles on a trial basis. So yeah, we'll be looking at various other options. We currently offer a, a very large variety of waste disposal routes. And there's also new, as you mentioned then, uh, different options coming on stream. Uniforms? Uh, uniforms. I, I went live with the recycled uniform roughly September last year. So unfortunately, it's not a case of just taking everybody's uniform off them and replacing it with recycling. So we we went live September last year. We've got about a dozen products at the moment that are all high use products from jackets, fleeces, high visibility tops that the yard teams wear and they're all made out of either recycled polyesters or some of them are actually made out of recycled plastic bottles. Wow, that's pretty cutting edge, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not aware of any other uh, operators doing that, but we've got a long-standing relationship with supplier of personal protective equipment and uniform and have discussed the options of recycling with them. They're bringing new products through all the time. Like I say, we're, we're running about 12 products at the moment. So we're we're trying to phase out our current stock, you know, Dock Masters jackets, Dock Masters fleeces, and gradually replacing them with the recycled options. And strangely enough, they're they're actually uh, they're cheaper than the current products. So it's a win win for everybody, really. Looking forward five years, uh, what would you hope to see? What would your expectations be, Joe? From my point of view, for ourselves, I'd like to see us, you know. Uh, in a position where we are fully sustainable or in a fully circular economy, 0% to landfill. They're increasing their the recycling rates as we speak. This year we've gone to data chipped waste receptacles so we can actually see exactly what's going in each one at each site and what's being lifted. 
and where that end disposal route is for each bin that's picked up. We're also looking at, from a wastewater side of things, a lot of our boatyard sites have wash down facility filtration systems. We've just installed uh, another new one at one of our sites, but we're looking to start with that one as a, a full re recirculating system. So it uses the water to wash the boat and then that goes through a filter system and it's stored to essentially wash the second boat again with the same water. So we're looking at all areas really. Yeah, I mean, that's brilliant. Didn't know that, and I think it's important, and clearly part of the strategy now from MDL is to get this information out, isn't it? And that's part of what these podcasts are about, is passing on this information so people do know that the company is taking this all very seriously indeed. Yeah, Kerry, uh, if I'm honest, like I say, I, I've worked for MDL for a, for a fair few number of years, and we, we've always looked at the environmental aspects and but we've never really shouted about it for want of a better expression we're also looking at autonomous floating robots that roam around the marinas picking up garbage so we're, we're looking at as a project at the moment so there's a lot of essentially quite cutting edge projects that, that we're looking to develop further we talked earlier about what mdl birth holders generally can do to help more the same applies to tenants i suppose yeah, like I say, Kerry, one, one of the biggest things from our waste suppliers is obviously the, like I mentioned before, is the segregation of waste into the appropriate receptacles. So you'll see at our sites now. So we, we signed two new long, longish term waste contracts last year. Unfortunately, due to COVID and uh, supply restrictions, they, they've only kind of just come online at the start of this year. But basically what we wanted was a an easy customer experience. So if a customer comes from, say, Shamrock Key and goes to... Torquay, the bins are all the same so it makes segregation easier so they know which bins to put the recycled in which bins to put the general waste in so all of our bins are now color coded across the estates you know what that is so obvious in some ways isn't it but it's so easy not to think that through this is really joined up thinking now yeah, I hope so. I mean, obviously part of that is uh, working in collaboration with our suppliers now, the, the waste suppliers that, we, that we've chosen to work with, as well as their uh, credentials from a zero to landfill policy, you know, that they've got a bigger picture themselves. So, for example, our hazardous waste supplier, they're, they're looking at the moment of uh, a full circular economy for waste oil, which they take away from sites. So that they're looking at taking that away, having it treated, additives added, and then it comes back into the pipeline to be fed back into the machines that it's come out of in the first place. There's lots of things, lots of possibilities. The big thing for me is that MDL are very, very proactive and we're always looking at each turn of where we can improve what our offering is to our customer, but also to minimise our impact on the environment. Dr Adam rejoins me now. And my first question to him was, how ingrained is the circular economy within the UK marine sector? I think the circular economy is one of those phrases that means something to everyone and, and never the same to everyone. And, and I, it's not just about reducing waste to landfill. It, it really is about not buying products for the sake of it. It's about buying into a service. So you might hire your electrical you might buy lights rather than light bulbs you're buying access to a service rather than a product sometimes and we do get asked increasingly as a service provider to help customers go on a journey that is going to enable them to be more more circular that often starts with a simple question like can we recycle this or that or or what do we do with our organic material the stuff that comes out the kitchen so that's a great starter for 10 for me because then I can go, well, why don't we have a look at your bins? Why don't we look at everything else that you're doing? Maybe there's a better service here that isn't simply about collecting rubbish in a different format. Maybe we can help you think differently about the services and, and, and products that you're buying and using and leasing, perhaps. I think it's a journey. And as a customer, I'd, I'd say you're asking the right questions. I, I think you're at the avant-garde. You're certainly not in the lower echelons of the uh, transition shall we say i think the marine sector is a place that we operate we operate in many sectors and i think some like the food and drink sector are probably you know ramping up much faster than others but i, I think they get hit by public demand a little bit more obviously on a daily basis i think that is driving a change in attitude and that whole essence that whole raison d'etre for circular economy it's actually getting right back to the manufacturing stage isn't it it's actually building that into the product at the beginning not at the end yeah, you want to design products so that they can be dismantled, repaired, refurbed, upgraded. 
what you don't want to do is buy something and it's it's composite it's mixed material it's laminated it's stuck together you know not only does that make it hard to recycle you, you've made it impossible to do anything else so that that ultimately will then end up either being burnt for energy or heat recovery or, or going to landfill so if you can design products then you can design a service around those products i really like the idea of refillable packaging you can go back to a supermarket or your on, online retailer will will deliver you that you know a concentrated product that you then drop into the previous packaging that to me has to become a bit more of the norm whether you're you know working at a marina working in a shop or, or working in an office block there are lots of opportunities i think for you going i can get a refillable i can get a returnable i don't need to buy another plastic bag or a plastic uh, container or, or whatever it might be. And it's not only plastic, of course, anything that's single use in my eyes is, is not really an ideal scenario uh, long term. For a few of us of a certain age, we seem to be going back in time. This is not the future. This is actually going back to the past. Well, I, it is a little bit. I think I'm not old enough to remember the Second World War, but the Second World War really drove an appreciation for resources because they were at risk. There was limited availability of all sorts of items, including food. And of course, we had rationing that created a sense of value that meant we were very good at recovering our metals and tins in particular, not so much plastics back then. And you look at the oil crisis in the 70s and exactly the same. It, it changed the way that we valued things. It changed the way that we behaved. And I think we now live in a world that, you know, you've got, a, you know, the Ukraine situation. You, you've got our Brexit position. Th these are going to start to to put pressure on resources in a way that perhaps we hadn't conceived before. And I think that will drive many of us to adopt behaviours that perhaps your mum and dad or your, your, your grandparents were second nature almost. I, I was a kid 25 years ago. I used to take my one litre glass bottles of Corona pop back to the news agents for a 5p and that was my pocket money. And, and that idea of deposit returns is it, it, it's back on the agenda and is likely to come to play in the, in the near future. Generation X, the next generation, the next generations coming behind us now, they're not going to accept some of the world that we've been inhabiting up to now in this throwaway disposable economy. That They're going to demand that the circular economy is actually front and centre of everything that we do. I, you're absolutely right. I, I go into schools, at both junior, but more importantly, the secondary schools now. And the questions I get asked about why this, why that? How are you dealing with that? What's your contribution to climate change? How are you protecting resources? We are just better informed. And, and honestly, people that come and work for us are asking exactly the same questions. W what's your contribution to decarbonisation? How are you supporting biodiversity? Where is the social value that your services can create? This is a different world we live in. People expect far more than just a simple linear economy out of sight, out of mind. You know, let's let's dump it. It's somebody else's problem. We'll export it. That None of that is acceptable anymore. We're being challenged to think not only more circular, but to think UK. How do we process that in the UK? How do we create jobs around that? Where's where's the new opportunities for, for green economies? So I, I, I like the fact we're being challenged. It's just a shame that we've got a global crisis that's really at the heart of of creating that challenge. Suez has been working with MDL now for over a decade. What makes the partnership between Suez and MDL work, do you think? Great question. And, and I love talking about customers that we've been on a journey with. And I think 10 years is a journey. I, I think we like our customers to be willing to ask difficult question and be asked difficult questions. We like our customers to be ready to change when they get good advice. And I think, you know, MDO over the years has been willing to adapt. It's been willing to change its signage, to have new bins, to take on technology. It's progressing at the speed that we feel this sector and other sectors need to progress at. So we're always far more responsive to a customer that is proactive, engaged, dynamic, and really you can see that they want to make a difference. And I think MDO is a great example of that. And the contract that's now been re-signed with MDL is actually really kind of critical because it's actually saying that nothing is going to go into landfill. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's a much more common statement now than you might have heard a few years ago. But we can stand behind it because, you know, not only will we re recycle that material wherever possible, the more that customers and tenants on these sites can do their bit by separating the material, the easier that gets. 
But then we'll be looking to recover some of that material. We'll be taking it to energy from waste. We'll be generating heat. We'll be looking to pull out other recyclable materials from those industrial processes. It's a commitment that we're happy to stand behind. When a customer wants to go on that journey, we embrace that because we want to help our customers to recycle more and ultimately to produce less. That's got to be the, the long-term target. One area I would like to just dig into a bit more detail uh, from the marine sector particularly, of course, the difference between 10 years ago and now in terms of what can actually be recycled because it seems to me that, and you've already referenced this once or twice, there seems to be an almost plethora of material now that can be recycled it's just a question of segmenting it uh, sorting it out give us a flavor of the sort of things that the marine sector could uh, recycle more of well i mean there's, there's all the classic packaging types from aluminium and, and, and steel through to plastics and glass pots tubs and trays love all that paper card not a problem there even your waxy cartons for example the, the tetra pack uh, milk cartons for example so you know all of that classic material you see lots of that at all sorts of sites fine we'll take all of that um what we tend to not want is as hygiene products and things that come out of the, the toilets and the restrooms but we'd happily take the food waste and we'll happily work on where the organic material might be coming from on site again because in the near future we're going to see mandated food waste collections coming to businesses and households across the UK. One of the things of working with somebody like Suez is we're already looking at what that new legislation is, is likely to require. How are we going to make sure our services are fit for purpose? And, and so we'll be working with MDL to say, well, you know, we need to think about these other material streams to make sure that we're not ignoring. You know, think about crisp packets. Think about chocolate wrappers. At the moment, they're not being captured for recycling, but in the future, we're working on a couple of pilot trials at the moment with other customers to, to, to prove the point that you can capture them and you can recycle them. And government look likely to want to introduce mandated collections of that type of material from probably 2025, 2026. So again, more of the material that you and I might think oh, I'm not sure about, well, that will be coming into the system in the relatively short term. And coming down, as I said, into the marine sector even more is batteries obviously oil obviously um, of course there's a huge area and a big discussion point of course is fiberglass and boats are built of fiberglass still that is a real challenge for the sector isn't it yeah you're ending on particularly the toughest question of them all in terms of the fiberglass you mentioned batteries and, and oils and yep systems in place I, you know as long as you're keeping them separate talk, talk to us or talk to your relevant officers across the sites we'll make sure that they're handled appropriately. But fiberglass is interesting. We've been working on a project with wind turbines, and that's another one of those new tech, new material streams that kind of seemed like it was gonna save the planet, and then we haven't got a solution for it. Don't worry, things like fiberglass, fiberboards, looking at these new composite materials, there's constant research happening, and we're involved in a number of large European-wide programs investigating not only the how-to, but also the commercialization and the scaling up of those solutions. So I think they're all material streams that have either got a solution in the not too distant future, or will have redesign opportunities where those materials will be able to be repurposed for, for at least a secondary life whilst we're building you know, that technology to, to, to solve it end of life as well. An encouraging item to finish on in one way and, uh, as you say, a difficult one as well. But, hey, absolutely brilliant to talk about some of the areas that you and Sue is uh, that works for both sides. I think you could call it a win-win, can't you? I hope so. I, I think I'd, I'd hate to think we were in a purely contractual relationship that didn't have opportunities for both of us to learn and develop and to, and to get the rewards from. I, I think if you want to go on a 10-year journey of improving your recycling and reducing your residual waste then it's got to be more than just contractual. And I think, yeah, this is a win-win and the opportunities are almost endless as we go forward. My final guest today is Holly Manville, who I was really interested to ask about how they've actually expanded on the two main aims of her clean sailors group. The first is really to activate all of our sailors as ambassadors for the very plane that we so love, um, the sea, and also to help facilitate and disrupt somewhat the sailing industry into being a little bit cleaner from materials use, 
recycling, upcycling, all the way down to how we're building the very boats and sails that we are playing around with on the water. And through that, we've got a couple of other, one around marinas, clean the marina, which is all about uh, facilitating ports and harbours in the same, and also a resale, which is a global platform that we've recently launched around the upcycling of sailing materials, which is very exciting. That's, uh, we've got tons of partners on there where sailors can drop off their old sailing kit, sails and lines in particular, and see them get made into other fantastic things. And also now have a racing team, which is promoting clean sailors sort of globally in the dinghy and foiling kind of sector. So it's all basically about just talking with and to um, sailors in the wider marine industry to facilitate the biggest possible change. Wow, it, it's a tall order. It's a long list of things you're trying to achieve. Uh, and clearly it's not just you, you've got a team behind you, I know. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment, but let's pick up on one thing you said there, which was the cleaner marinas. And that's the focus of today's episode. So let's just look at the a bit more granular detail about marinas because boats spend, what, 95% of their time in a marina. There's a lot of work that can be done to protect the environment when you have boats in marinas, isn't there? Hugely, and and sadly you're right about the amount of time our sort of boats spend in marinas and the sort of global utilisation rate of boats is actually less than 5%, so you can imagine how much time a lot of our vessels are just sitting dormant on their moorings and in their berths. But for us certainly, I mean, you know, sailors are an incredibly important part of this ocean ecosystem because we use it, but marinas really we see as gateways to our adventures on, on water. They, are, they play an incredibly important role in helping to keep our waters clean Sure, there are meeting places, there are safe havens and our pit stops and where our sort of adventures begin and where they end, but they're also home too for many creatures above and below the waterline. And, you know, through Clean and Marina in particular and MDL being one of our partners, we really support marinas as being guardians for cleaner, healthier seas. And not least because so much boat work is done in marinas and on the hard. And also refueling and boat bottom stripping and anti-fouling and everything else. They really are opportunities to to really help all of our sailors in the wider community get cleaner and treat the sea a little bit differently and what can i mean put my teeth back in and what can actual sailors what can boat owners do what's this marginal gain for for the win here what are the individual bits that people could be more aware of and actually do something about holly I think as individual sailors, there's quite a lot. I mean, advocate obviously the sort of use of, of better, more ocean-friendly products on your boat as a starting point. I think a lot of us, and I think in the past myself being guilty too, it's that oh, we're just you know going out for a week, we'll grab what we can from the, the closest supermarket or shop, whether that's from your washing up liquid all the way down to your loo cleaner and including even your sunscreen. And what we're really appreciating over the last couple of years through our own research and that of others is that everything that we use on the water ends up pretty much straight in the sea. There, is, there isn't this fancy complex sewage system between us and the waters we're sailing, we're right next to it. So everything that we do on our boats really we take um, for granted. It's, it's quite separate from the waters that we're sailing on but it's not. So whether it's uh, using more natural ocean friendly or ocean minded you know, things from shampoo bars to cleaning products to to zinc based sunscreen is really important and certainly you know anti-fouling is another one we've found in studies that anti-foul on the bottom of our keel boats is actually leaving trails of microplastic in our waters the same way that aeroplanes leave vapor trails in the sky and that's due to anti-foul paint obviously being made of plastic so um, gosh never actually really thought that through never uh, that's a really good you got there between vapor trails and anti-foul that's that's a pretty strong picture you're painting there it's incredibly powerful and i think it's something which is 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 less known and obviously part of what we do is is helping to make um, those kind of opportunities a lot more visible to a broader audience but I think they also you know but anti-foul is is a biofoul so it's it's made to deter living things and in order to do that it obviously has to be slightly toxic or traditionally has been slightly toxic but we've got some fantastic new partners who are showcasing and demonstrating that technology is moving very quickly and innovation is moving quickly and there are opportunities for us to have the same performance of a vessel and actually less time and effort spent scrubbing down your bottom and repainting through their new kind of products because we're I think now becoming increasingly aware just the depth of our impact um, that we're having on our waters and as I said pretty much everything that we do on our boats or otherwise ends up in the sea so being more mindful of that I think is a great starting point for all of us. Now these things all come at a price Holly nothing happens for free 
it's a difficult juxtaposition between cost and environmental care, if you like. A difficult balance to make sometimes, particularly in these environment, you know, particularly in these sort of times. I think it, it, I would have said maybe five years ago, I agree with you. I think certainly now less economic trade off for making a, a sort of more ocean minded decision about what we're using. I mean, certainly with more modern anti foul products, the price is comparable to removing and restoring a boat bottom with traditional anti-foul paints. The newer technologies actually last longer. So where you'd be pulling your boat out every couple of years, you can now pull them out every five to seven years, which is a massive gain in terms of time, cost and energy without obviously having the, the same environmental impact. I think anti-foul technologies will take a little bit longer in order to spread more broadly because there's a obviously there's, it's important to test the products and and raise awareness of them, which is obviously why we've got uh, these partnerships in place. But there is so much now that's so mass marketed, which is so much better for our boats, also for us and also for our waters, you know, whether it's eco-friendly washing up liquid, like I said, or ocean-friendly sunscreen, they are pretty much everywhere now. And finding really good products is a lot easier than it used to be. Sometimes they are a little bit more costly, but what you'll also find is they come in a concentrated form. So you actually need to use less for the same kind of outcome. So over time, that will the cost will be brought down as they are um, picked up by more and more people. But it's definitely uh, becoming less of an argument that there is more expensive to move to these kind of different kind of methods. We're looking at getting people to recycle more. It's it's a DNA. It's in the DNA now, particularly as far as living in a house is concerned, living in a flat. You've you've got that whole process there ready for you in terms of the different coloured bins, etc. We're starting to see that emerging in marinas, but not all marinas. So you've got a challenge there, not just in terms of the end user, but in places where actually you can have the receptacles there ready to receive these kind of recyclable items. Absolutely. And I think the the biggest thing that I've certainly found over the last two years and we still find is that, you know, sailors can do an awful lot themselves. But actually, as we said, where boats are moored and berthed actually play a huge role in just how clean we can all actually become. And actually being able to access the facilities required to be cleaner sailors depends on our ports, marinas and harbours having those facilities in place and the infrastructure behind them. And we're quite fortunate, certainly, in most parts of the UK and through marinas such as, such as MDL who take their responsibility very seriously to, to be able to access things like recycling and waste disposable, hazard waste bins, etc. But I appreciate that's still not, not the case everywhere, which is exactly what we're working on through our Cleaner Marina project, is showing uh, that it can be done at a relatively low cost and the impact is, is disproportionately positive on not just your reputation, but actually levelling up the whole ecosystem to be a lot more attractive and future-proofed. Yeah. Marginal gains again. Get uh, more people involved. You're more likely to make a chance of, of change. You mentioned earlier, Holly, about sails being recycled. Now, this has been going on for many, many years. There's companies that are formed and making coats uh, and jackets and bags out of old sails. I think what you're saying is is there's a real resurgence there of interest uh, and people are doing it more. and, And there is actually now a funnel for getting your old sails turned into something useful again. Yeah, I mean, through our research again, I mean, we've been finding that still, despite, you know, sort of upcycle projects existing in various places around the world and sort of lifestyle producers making new things, there's still about 97% of all sales still end up in landfill. And for for myself, who has a sort of, you know, small keel boat, my sail will last me a decade if I look after it. But if you think about high-performance racing from Vendée to Sail GP America's Cup, to you know the Optimist World Championships, sales are a lot more disposable because they're put to the absolute test in those um, intense environments. So there's a lot still going to waste, and we've seen an opportunity, obviously, to try and connect sailors and their old sales with any project that's in need of them. And you know, launching our resale platform a couple of months ago was very much about just providing this global platform, connecting supply and demand. So we're working sort of three areas. One is obviously upcycle what already exists there are projects already doing upcycling so how can we get them more raw stock and actually keep sales out of landfill but the other element is encouraging the constructional change of sales as an example the very nature of sale composition needs to develop so that the materials can be more easily 
deconstructed reclaimed to music at the end oh so you're talking here about uh, actual 360 recycling built into actually the product itself at the beginning as we're doing as we're starting to see emerging with clothing yeah, and it's something that's incredibly important because upcycling efforts are fantastic. There's there's no denying it. Giving something another life and saving it for another 10 years out of the landfill that it's probably destined for is, is noble. But what we really want to help facilitate in the industry more broadly is let's try and reduce the waste, if not entirely. And I think one thing that obviously can change, and there's some fantastic sale makers, one sales in particular, who are making great leaps in terms of changing the way they're making sales in order that they're using less toxic products. Instead of using glues, they're using heat pressing. So there's a lot happening in that, but encouraging constructional change is one thing, but we're also working on the material science of sales themselves because there are so many bags and coats and bean bags and deck chairs that can be made out of old sales and they are fantastic and they've got such a history to them. But we also are understanding where sales can be used in other contexts and environments and industries. So. It's a material, a resource, which has inherent qualities that make it exceptional for certain things. And it may not be in sailing and it may not be in marine. So we're working with a couple of partners to look at how that kind of material can be used. Could it be insulation? Could it be in the automotive industry? I mean, the opportunities are endless. But actually being able to demonstrate that this material has life beyond its original use is really our goal. Wow. Uh, as always, Holly, you and I disappeared down various rabbit holes during our conversations. <laughs> Let's just get to the, the nub of this now and, and as we reach to the end of today's uh, episode is uh, just a few hints and tips then to summarise for the average boat owner. Uh, what would you like them to start to do, to be aware of, to actually action? That's a great question. I think the easiest one for us is just to try and reduce our usage of things which only have a single life. So certainly single-use plastics, making sure that we reuse as much as possible. I think a boat is a perfect example because you can have an old jam jar which then becomes screw pot for another decade. So there's always an opportunity to, to give something another use. And just being mindful of where our products come from and what they contain because plastic and recyclability is a very complex topic and recycling is a solution but it's there's 91% of plastic that doesn't ever get recycled even when you put it into a recycling bin. So the key thing is, is really challenging ourselves to think about what we're using something for, do we need it and what can we be doing with it afterwards. Well that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed hearing from all of our guests and it's really given you some food for thought. As I mentioned at the beginning, you can find out more about these stories from hashtag Greener Marinas. I hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode and that you'll join us again soon for more episodes of This Marina Life with MDL Marinas and me, Kerry Herford-Jones. <laughs> <laughs>